So Martin, it's good to have you back. Martin was with us when we started the lockdown talks. The first talk ever was by Martin, the Warblers for Dummies. And we are now back with Raiders for Dummies. It's good to have you back, Martin. And we hope you have no thunderstorms coming this time back home. So, Kavi, will you take, will you take over? Yes. Okay, I think we're good to go. I'll just start with a brief introduction of Martin, though most of you would already know him. So Martin started birding as a small boy 50 years ago. After completing research on birds in the UK, East Africa, and South America, he then spent five years working for BirdLife International before moving to Save the Children, where he was based for four years in Colombia and another four years in India. Now he runs a bird lodge in Extremadura, Spain, and he's also a PhD in warblers. So over to you, Martin. Can you hear me now? Yes, Martin. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Uh, so, uh, well, a very good afternoon to you all. It's uh, very kind to be re-invited back to, uh, to, give a, to give a talk. I gave one on warblers about uh, it, at late March, early April. It was about two weeks into the lockdown here in, in Spain. And so I'm back again uh, to talk about waders. Um, I remember on one of the very first Delhi bird walks I uh, took part in, we were walking at Okla and I paused to take a look at waders, some waders that were on the mud there beside the river. And someone mentioned that uh, they had noticed that uh, British bird watchers were always very keen on waders. And I thought about it and, and yes, uh, I think it was, it, it's right. I think it's, it's a group of birds that uh, for people who start their bird watching in Britain, um, it, it's a very attractive group because uh, it takes you to places uh, along the coast and along river estuaries um, away from home to see birds that one is not normally seeing uh, close to one's uh, garden and uh, to see birds that have come from many different parts of the world altogether. So there's something quite romantic about uh, waders as a group and, and watching them. And in fact, um, although I did a PhD on warblers, my very first research, which I did as an undergraduate, was on waders, on Dunlin. And I would head out from the university town, uh, hitchhiking, to the, uh, to the coast. I had, had very little money and so I had to hitchhike. Um, and I arrived at, uh, in the winter, it was winter weekends. I'd got there on a Thursday afternoon uh, at this particular site. I slept in an unheated uh, chalet on the beach. And first thing in the morning on the Friday, I would sit and watch Dunlin all day long, looking at their foraging behavior. Then the Saturday morning, I would go out onto the mud flats and collect mud, uh, which I'd put into plastic bags. And so I would then hitch hike back to the university with my rucksack full of mud. And I don't think many of the drivers who gave me lifts realized what I was carrying in, in the bag. Um, now this talk uh, is really aimed at uh, people who are uncertain uh, and, and uh, a little bit uh, bewildered by the identification of waders. So really at the people who, who would describe themselves as, as beginners. And I'm gonna try to cover um, as, uh, as many of the waders that you're likely to encounter, but there will be a few species I won't cover uh, because otherwise the, the, the talk will just go on far too long. Um, but I will cover the, uh, the, some of the tricky species and give you some advice about how to approach the identification of these. And I'm stuck on the slide that you can see, a beautiful photograph of crab plovers by, by uh, Nick Hill. Um, and that's a wader which is pretty unmistakable. And uh, unfortunately, the challenge is most of them are not quite like that. So let's, uh, 
let's start. And uh, what I want to do right at the beginning is to acknowledge the, um, the photographers. And so I have been kindly given permission to use uh, photographs of waders um, produced by the, uh, taken by the team at uh, Wild Art. And uh, I've used many photographs of Nick Hills as well. And there are a few photographs by a, a friend of mine, John Hawkins. So, so those are the three sources of the, the photographs that I will use right through the talk. And this photograph on this slide shows a, a, a bit of picture by John Hawkins of a, a green shank. It's a rather lovely photograph. So as I say, this talk is really aimed at the people who would look at this photograph and then say help. Um, and we're looking at three waders. Uh, and this is what one's imagined that waders will will be like, fairly uh, nondescript, rather brownish, sit standing on, on mud. And uh, from this particular slide, uh, you can see that there are differences. The bird in the middle looks different from the bird, uh, bird on the left and the bird on the right. Um, it's got much darker plumage on the back and the legs look a bit pale. But actually, if I tell you that all three of them are little stints, um, that gives you some insight in the complexity of uh, identifying waders and why they can be a bit, bit of a challenge. And so let's start first of all with a little bit of terminology. Now this talk is, uh, uses the, the term waders, but you might well see in the literature, particularly any books from North America, uh, you'll see the word shorebird used. And you know, what's the difference between a wader and a shorebird? Well, both of them are just convenient names. They're, they, they're not biologically uh, accurate in that um, in the word waders is used across uh, Asia, Europe, uh, Africa to describe the birds that we're focusing on in this, this talk. But of course, other birds wade as well. And so in North America, the term wader is also applied to birds like herons and egrets. So any bird that wades. Um, they, in North America, they prefer the word shorebird. But of course, many species of what we call waders uh, are not just found on the shore, on the coast. Uh, they may be found inland, on rivers, on wetlands, or even in dry terrain, dry country. So shorebird is, is not a, a truly accurate term either. But for convenience, we use the word wader in, in, in the old world to describe the group of birds that we're going to be looking at today. And their general characteristics of this group of birds is that they are generally occurring in wet habitats, but not exclusively. Uh, most of them have long legs. Many of them have long wings because uh, most uh, species of wader are, are migratory and long distance migrants, most of them. Mostly they feed on invertebrates, but not exclusively. So there are some waders like thick knees that may feed on uh, uh, lizards and small mammals. Uh, Black-tailed godwits will feed a lot on grain. Um, so, but generally they are feeding on invertebrates. Many of them will wade into water, some of them will swim, and many of them also show sexual dimorphism, so you can tell the males from the females. And just to get the sort of technical side out of the way, um, looking at the, the, the scientific classification of waders, they form part of an order called the Charidiformes, which includes waders, gulls, and terns. Uh, but we're focusing on uh, the, the wader uh, set and those uh, divided up into four main suborders. The uh, Scolapaki, uh, which are the snipes and the sandpipers, the Charidae, 
the plovers, ibis bill, avocets, stilts, and oyster catchers, the chiondi, which are the thick knees, and the thinocori, which are the painted snipes and the jacanas. And so those are the, the four principal suborders that encompass what, what we would call the, the waders. And what I want to do today is to really focus on two, the two biggest groups. And uh, those are the um, scalapagi, which we, let's call them sandpipers, because that's easier to pronounce. So this is a group of waders, which are extremely varied, uh, all the way from the very tiny uh, waders like the stints to large waders like curlews but they're all generally characterized by having long bills and they feed frequently in water and they're often probing. And the other large group are the uh, charidae, which, are, which we'll call the plovers. Um, but this also includes birds like the lapwing. So let, but we'll, sim for simplicity, let's just refer to these as plovers. And these generally have short and straight bills and they have a very typical feeding behavior, which is, which I would call the three P's, pace, pause, and peck. So when you watch plovers feeding, they take a few steps, they stop, and then they peck at the surface. And this is a common behavior amongst all of the plovers. And they usually are feeding on the ground rather than in water, because they're picking things off the surface of the ground. And the plovers generally are, are much more boldly patterned than the sandpipers. So the key thing about starting to learn about waders and their identification is to decide which type of wader are you looking at. Are you looking at a sandpiper type wader or a plover type wader? And you know why is it that waders are actually so interesting? Well, um, I think they capture the imagination. Uh, these are birds which uh, many of them are migratory and when they do migrate they're often in flocks and you can actually see the migration. You see flocks of birds uh, coming down to land feeding together as a flock. There's a sense that these are birds on the move. Um, unlike warblers, uh, the other group of birds close to my heart, um, Waders can give you very prolonged views. For those of you who went who watched my warbler talk, I described having you know, the challenge of height, tr trying to identify a warbler is a bit like a jigsaw puzzle. You get a glimpse of the head and a glimpse of the wing, a glimpse of the, the bill, and then the bird disappears, and you've got to try and sort of put it all together. With a wader, you can actually sit and watch a wader for hours, the same individual. Um, they tend to be in quite open country. Um, they will just be feeding. They spend a lot of time resting because they can feed 24 hours a day. So they, they will be sleeping at, at certain times of the day. And so whereas with a warbler, you'll never see a warbler sleeping, uh, or very rarely, um, you very often see waders sleeping. And uh, that means you have to wait for them to wake up to try and work out what they were. A few days ago, I was watching some, some waders uh, which were fast asleep and I had to literally wait until one had lifted its head up so I could see its bill to try to work out what it was. So um, you do get the opportunity of being able to watch them uh, for a long time. And uh, an ideal instrument for watching waders is a telescope and so if you have a telescope or you can go with someone who has a telescope that's a tremendous asset advantage because often the waders are um, they can be quite far away but they do give you a long clear open view uh, watching waders gives you an insight into their different behaviors and it's a good uh, group of birds to start thinking about ecology and the feeding niches uh, that they, they occupy because you get many species together and you can see the differences in the way in their behaving and feeding. So that's a, a rather nice way of being able to get to understand the ecology of the birds. So for example, 
there is no other group of birds that has such a wide variety of bill size and shape. Um, there are waders with short bills, long bills, straight bills, bills that curve up, bills that curve down, fine bills, thick bills. Um, and there's even one, of course, the spoon-billed sandpiper with a bill shaped like a spoon. So all of these are representing um, evolutionary uh, uh, adaptations to feeding on particular prey in a particular type of um, context, a particular type of substrate. And this enables, uh, on a simple looking mud flat, for there to be different wader species feeding together because each of them are occupying a particularly a particular defined ecological niche so they can they can fit together um, and so this is one of the fascinating things about waders just thinking about how as a particular individual species has adapted has evolved to fill a, a particular niche and feed in a particular way and looking at the bill size and shape is one of the key things to help in the identification of these birds So the overall, what you need to do when you're looking at a wader and trying to identify it, there are certain things to focus on and concentrate on. The first is the size of the wader. Now, the advantage of waders is that very often you can compare what you're, the bird that you're looking at with other birds in the vicinity because they do often feed together in groups of different species. And so it's possible to work out whether you're looking at a small wader or a medium sized wader or a large wader simply by comparing it with, with others nearby. And that's important to understand whether you're looking at something which is a small wader, a medium sized wader or a large wader. The shape of the bird, um, the body shape, whether it's a slim bird or a, or a rather stocky bird, but most importantly, the shape of the bill, uh, the length of the bill compared to say the size of its head and the shape of the bill. Is it straight? Is it upturned? Does it go down? And so on. And the legs as well, the length of the legs. Uh, is the bird, does the bird have very long legs? Has it got short legs? When it flies, do the, do the toes extend beyond the tip of the tail, for example? The coloration is important, the plumage. Um, but particularly with waders, the colour of the bills and the legs. Does the bird have distinctive markings? And so here we have a, a slide with the black-tailed godwit and that has very bold white wing bars. So look for markings on the wing, markings on the rump and the tail. With some species of wader, the call is useful to note as well. Some of them call quite a lot and that can help to separate one species from another. The behavior is extremely important. The how it's feeding, um, is it an active feeder? Is it quite sluggish? Uh, when it flies, uh, does it fly up high? Does it keep low? Uh, are the wing beats rapid? Uh, is it slow in flight? And then the habitat, is it out in the open mud? Is it close to vegetation or is it in vegetation? Is it preferring to be in water or on dry ground? But there are also big challenges. And uh, these include the variation in the size of, of the birds, um, the different plumages that, different, that, that the same species will have at different times of the year, the, the, its different postures, and the lighting, and I'll talk about these in, in the next couple of minutes. And the key thing about any group of birds, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about waders or warblers or thrushes or finches or birds of prey or waterfowl, the key thing is to get to know the species well. Waders are an ideal group to, um, to, to get to know familiar species because you do have a opportunity of being able to see them well and to study them. By definition, you're more likely to see a common species than a rare species. 
but if you really know the common species, when you do come across an unusual bird, it will stand out. And so getting to grips with the common species really does pay off. Now, the size variation. Now, as I said, waders are, it's, they're fairly easy to, to work out whether you're looking at a small wader or a medium sized wader or a large wader, comparing it with birds that are nearby. But take a look at this slide. Here we have a bird in the front, which looks only about half the size of the bird behind. And yet these are the same species, they are rough. And we're looking at a, a female ruff and the male ruff behind. And in this particular species, the male is much, much bigger than the female, almost twice the size. This can be, of course, incredibly confusing. And then there are there's size variation with respect to um, where the bird comes from. So if you take a species like the Dunlin, which has a very wide distribution, the birds which breed at the very highest latitudes in the high Arctic are bigger than the ones which breed further south. But on migration and on the winter grounds, you get these populations mixing together. So in a single flock of Dunning, you can notice that some are bigger than others. And this, is, uh, this tells you that, some, that the biggest ones are the ones that have traveled furthest. They've come from further, further north. And there's a general rule uh, with um, uh, animals in, uh, that those that occur at higher lat latitudes are larger than the ones further south within the same species. And that's all to do with how the body evolves for heat conservation. The other thing to bear in mind with size is that there's also something called size distortion. And this slide is also, um, it gives you a slight distortion of the size difference between the male and female ruff. Yes, the male ruff, which is the one behind it, is a lot bigger. But there's also an optical illusion that happens when you look down a telephoto lens or down a telescope, when you're looking at a bird which is directly behind another bird. And the bird which is directly behind actually looks a little bit bigger than it really is. And that's due to this optical illusion. So when you are trying to work out whether a, a bird is a large wader or a small wader, try to compare it with birds which are alongside it at the same sort of distance rather than birds which are directly behind or directly in front. And that way you can avoid uh, this uh, optical illusion which has, uh, has been discovered um, that will affect uh, people looking through a lens, particularly a telescope or a telephoto lens. The other challenge is how birds will change in their appearance during the course of the year. Now here we have a slide with three waders and they all look very different from one another. But some of you will recognize that all of them are the same species. They are all curlew sandpipers. And the one at the bottom is a juvenile bird. The one in the middle is in an adult in winter plumage and the one at the top is an adult getting into breeding plumage. Now most waders have a sequence of plumages and so the juvenile birds uh, will be in juvenile plumage until about November and juvenile waders will tend to have very patterned backs. If you look at the lower bird you'll see that the feathers have got very obvious pale fringes to them. They are all also of an even um, size and shape. So if you look along the rows of the feathers on the wings, they're all about the same sort of size and they're very neat. Everything looks very fresh and very highly patterned. Um, the juvenile birds will usually have this plumage until about November and then they molt into um, the winter plumage and the winter plumage of both an adult and a juvenile bird is for most waders extremely similar and the winter plumages of the waders will generally be rather plain and uh, 
and then some waders will get into a very distinct breeding plumage and for in India for the birds that are migrating to the Arctic uh, you'll start to see the waders getting into their breeding plumage right at, um, uh, at the uh, 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 during spring just before they disappear and here we have a curlew sandpiper but this photograph I think was taken in April uh, by the wild art team and it shows a bird which is getting into breeding plumage. It is not yet in full breeding plumage, uh, but it is close to it. And you can see how dramatically different it looks from the bird in the middle. Um, the other thing about this set of three pictures is how different the birds look in shape. The bird in the middle looks quite stocky and thick necked whereas the birds uh, above and below look more slender. And this shows you the challenge also of how uh, the same species can look different depending on how it's behaving. When the waders are resting, they will tend to uh, put their heads close to their body, so the neck looks very, very short. When the bird is feeding, or when it's alert, perhaps a marsh harrier has flown over and the bird is, is alert, they, the necks tend to extend. And so the bird, that makes the bird look much more slimmer. So be aware of uh, what the bird is doing when trying to describe it as a, a slender looking bird or a stocky looking bird. And then there's the influence of lighting. Now, waders tend to be in this open country where there's a huge difference depending on what the position of the sun or whether it's cloudy or whether it's sunny and the impact of the background in terms of reflections and so on. So in this slide, we have two photographs of green shanks. The word on the right is in sunshine. The bird on the left in this paddy field is in, uh, in cloudy conditions and you can see how different the birds look. The bird on the right, the legs look quite pale gr yellowish green. The bird on the left, the, bird, the legs look a very gray green. And the bird on the right in the sunshine looks, has got quite brownish tones. The bird on the left is much more grayer looking. And so the, the light will play tricks as well. So let's go into um, the two main groups of waders and look first of all at what I'll call the sandpipers, which is a group that um, covers a wide range of waders from stints to curlews. There are in fact 10 recognized groups within this broad uh, suborder. Um, and you know I won't go through each individual group but the ones that, which are the little ones like the Dunlin and the Stints and the Curlew Sandpipers they are all of the genus Calidris which in North America they're often described as peeps. Um, the birds like the green shank and the what we call sandpipers, green sandpiper, wood sandpiper, marsh sandpiper, are, are all tringers. So, that, so they're, they're all the same genus, tringer. So the, there are several different uh, ge um, genuses within this particular group. Now, uh, as a group, they are generally long-billed uh, wading birds, and they feed mainly by touch. And so they're probing the bill into uh, into mud or they're putting the bill into water so they can't see what they are feeding on and they're detecting their food um, thanks to lots of nerve endings at the end of the bill making the end of the bill extremely sensitive and so that's detecting by touch sometimes even by pressure differences to capture the movement of some invertebrate or a worm or something uh, in in the mud. And so we'll start with the smallest. And this is a very common uh, wading bird, which is well worth getting really familiar with. Uh, uh, it occurs both on coastal areas and also along rivers and, uh, and, uh, and, and wetlands, and it's the little stint. And 
if you remember the slide of the curly sandpipers, three different plumages, well here we have those same three different plumages for this species, the little stint. On the left is a juvenile little stint um, with quite reddish feathers on the back and you can't see it brilliantly in this photograph but they, they, they have a white line along the uh, like a brace, braces are often called along the, on, on the back. And like a, a slightly subdivided um, supercilium at the, at the front of the head. Um, the winter uh, plumage is much grayer and plainer. And the summer plumage, the breeding plumage is a very attractive, very rusty looking bird, um, particularly around the head and the neck. Now stints have got uh, short bills compared with other sandpipers, a good way of trying to estimate or, or come to, um, to describe the length of the bill is to compare the length of the bill with the distance from the tip of the bill, from, from the base of the bill to the eye or to the back of the head. And as you can see, this bill is not as long as the, as the length of the head. So I'm, I'm pointing at the bird in summer plumage on the right, can see the cursor there from the tip of the bill to the base of the bill that distance is less than from the base of the bill to the back of the head so it's a rather short bill and it's pretty much straight it's got a very very slight curve but it, it looks pretty straight uh, to me and the thing about the uh, little stint is it, it has dark legs but look at this bird here on the left the juvenile bird those legs look pale. Well, this is another challenge. Waders will be spend a lot of time in mud. And when the mud dries on the legs, that can change the color of the legs. So the juvenile bird does have black legs, but because it's been wading deep in this rather brown mud, and it's a sunny day, that mud has dried, and it's making those legs look paler than they really are. And this is a problem when you're then trying to work out the difference between the little stint and the temming stint, because one of the key ways of telling a temming stint is that it has pale legs. But if you look at the bird on the right here, also a temming stint, this one has been in rather black mud and those legs are partly covered with dry black mud, making the, the, changing the color of some, some part of that leg. The Temming stint, like the little stint, has got this rather short, straight bill, possibly slightly more curved than a little stint, but pretty much the same shape and size. But overall, it's a plainer looking bird, particularly the bird in um, winter plumage, where it looks very soft and grey, um, and it's got quite a broad greyish band across the breast. The other difference between the temic stint and the little stint is that when they fly, the temic stint has got a lot of white on the side of the tail. And when it is, uh, if it flies off, it tends to fly quite high, uh, calling uh, before dropping back to the ground, uh, often flying quite a long distance, whereas little stints tend to keep closer to the ground. So they've got a different behavior. They also have a quite a different feeding behavior. I'll just put the slide of the two together. Here's the temic stint on the left in winter plumage and the little stint on the right in winter plumage. You can see the softer, more evenly cover, uh, color uh, plumage of the temic stint and the more slightly more patterned co uh, color of the little stint, a bit whiter around the front of the, of the head. Um, the little stint is a very active feeder. They're often in groups, busily feeding away, uh, pecking at the, at the ground with very rapid uh, movements. The temic stint uh, tends to be more solitary or in much smaller groups, tends to be more sluggish, uh, feeding in a much slower way and often a little bit closer to vegetation, whereas the little stint is often right out in the open. So there are these subtle differences in behavior, which will are useful to note because that helps again to separate two very similar species. And there is 
other species that you can confuse with the stints, uh, particularly on coastal areas, a bird which many people confuse with the, with the little stint is the sandling. Now the sandling is much bigger than a little stint. When you see them together, a little stint and a sandling side by side, there's no, uh, there's, there's no problem in separating them because the sandling is a lot bigger than a little stint. But if it's on its own, you can see that the bill, again, is fairly short, straight, it's a little bit thicker perhaps than the little stint, but you know, if you're looking at this bird at a distance, it would look fairly uh, stint-like in its proportions. The legs are also dark, but it's a much, much whiter looking bird. And in the winter plumage has a very distinctive dark patch here on the elbow of the wing. And it's much whiter around the front of the head. But it's a pitfall. Um, if you see one on its own, uh, many people can be misled into th identifying it as a little stint or vice versa, identifying um, little stints as, as sandlings. And then the other bird that uh, can be confusing is the dunlin. Um, now the dunlin uh, has a bill which is longer than that of the stint, but there's a great variation in the bill length of dunlin depending on the subspecies and where, you know, where the dunlin comes from. So some populations of dunlin have rather straight bills, some have much more curved bills. Uh, but again, it's a bigger wader. When you see one next to a little stint, there's, there's no question about the difference. But again, a bird on its own can um, look you know, quite similar. It has a similar, similar feeding behavior to, to a little stint, but the bill is never as short as a little stint is. So look at the length of this bill at the bottom here, uh, compared with the head. And you can see that this bill is uh, easily as long as, if not longer than the, the, than, than the length of the head. Uh, and this is a rather short build dunlin. There are, most dunlin have longer bills than this. So it's making that, looking at the proportions, the bill length is, 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 is a very helpful identification of these small sandpipers. The other bird that Dunlin uh, will be confused with often will be the curly sandpiper. Now, when they're in breeding plumage, um, then it's very straightforward. So at the top left is a Dunlin in breeding plumage, and the bottom right is a curly sandpiper in breeding plumage. Very easily to, easy to tell apart. And you will see Dunlin in breeding plumage both at the, um, in the spring as they're heading north and also the some of the adults returning in the autumn will still be, uh, have traces of this uh, breeding plumage. And it's the only uh, small wader, it's the only sandpiper in fact that has a black patch in the middle of the belly. So it's a very distinctive bird in the breeding plumage. But if you look in the winter, this is a, uh, the top right is a winter plumage dunlin and the bottom right is a winter plumage curly sandpiper and they look extremely similar. They both have rather uh, uniform greyish uh, uh, above and um, the bill of both of these birds looks fairly similar. This is fairly long billed dunlin here um, and it has a very slight curve to it. The curly sandpiper bill um, is long, has an obvious curve, and you notice how the bill of the curly sandpiper does tend to taper a bit. So it's quite um, thick at the base, and then it gets narrower towards the tip. Whereas the dunlin, um, the bill is, you know, doesn't tend to get so fine towards the tip. It's a much more uniform uh, proportioned bill. Uh, you know, stouter along much more of its length. But it can be, they can be quite difficult to tell apart in that plumage. But as soon as they fly, then it's a lot easier. The Coley Sandpiper has a completely white rump. Uh, the Dunlin, this picture, it's difficult to tell, uh, but 
if you look, for example, at this bird I'm pointing to at the moment, you'll see that the rump is, the, the white on the rump is divided into two. So it has the brown of the back going down towards the tail as a line which divides uh, the rump into two parts. So you've got white either side of a dark line in the center of the, of the rump. So when the birds fly off, take a look at um, the rump and the curly sandpiper's white rump will be able to separate the, uh, the bird from the dunlin straight away. Another bird that um, can be similar to a dunlin is the broad-billed sandpiper, which is uh, mainly a bird that one would find on the coast. Uh, both Dunlin and, and Broadbilled Sandpipers, if you look at the pictures at the bottom, um, they are both rather stocky, a hunch, hunched backed birds. Um, the Broadbilled Sandpiper has got quite a heavy looking head, you know, in terms of proportions, that head looks a little bit odd. The other thing about the Broadbilled Sandpiper is that the legs are shorter in proportion to the body than they are with Dunlin. So they look rather short-legged. So when you're seeing a broad-billed sandpiper with Dunlin, you'll notice a wader which is shorter-legged. And as such, it moves around in a different sort of way. It, it has a different behavior as it moves. So it will tend to, to, to stick out amongst the, the, the Dunlin it's, it's with. The bill is similar to a Dunlin, but it has a little kink at the bay, at the tip, so it's quite broad at the at, at the base, quite straight, and then it has this little kink downwards at the end. And the other feature on the head is that the um, it has the supercilium, which are quite a well marked supercilium, and then um, a pale line above um, the dark line above the eye. So it has a much more complex head pattern than the Dunlin. So it's almost like a double supercilium, a double pale supercilium. On the, on the side of the, of the head. Um, the, the wing pattern is quite similar, but uh, the Dunlin has an obvious wing bar. The broad-billed sandpiper has a wing bar, but it's not quite as, as, as striking as that of the Dunlin. But it's when you see the birds walking around that you, you start noticing the difference, in particular the rather odd shape that the, the broad-billed sandpiper has. And just to, to end up with two more of this uh, genus Calidris um, that you tend to find on the coast. The bird on the right is the sandling, which I showed this uh, a picture of a sandling com to compare it with a little stint. Um, but also, uh, I'm just throwing in the, uh, the bird on the left because it's such an extraordinary bird. It's an extremely rare bird, uh, but it does uh, occur um, in India, particularly the you know, Bay of Bengal and, and, and the, uh, in Sri Lanka as well. And it's the spoon-billed sandpiper. Um, and that uh, is an amazing bird to, to see. Um, it's small, it's a bit like a little stint. Um, a much whiter looking bird than a little stint, much, much whiter around the head. Uh, in a sense, like a miniature version of a sandling, but without the sort of black uh, elbow marking um, and it has this extraordinary bill, um, spoon shaped bill, uh, which you can see when the bird is facing you but if its bird is sideways on you it's not something that you, it, it's obvious so you need to wait for the bird to move its to move its head but uh, yeah gold marks um, 10 out of 10 for anyone who finds spoon-billed sandpiper and if you do please make sure that your recording your sighting gets recorded because um, it is a critically endangered species and many of them are, are, are coloring or have flags attached to their legs and if you see one and, and can record how it's marked then that will be extremely useful useful We'll now move into this middle group of waders, which are the, uh, um, the, the middle-sized group of sandpipers. And the two common ones, which uh, you can easily get familiar with anywhere in, in India, are the green and wood sandpipers. Um, the one in the middle here is the, uh, the green sandpiper. It's um, a bird with uh, 
rather long, uh, darkish uh, legs, uh, a long, straight, dark bill, and the plumage shows a great contrast between um, pretty much unpatterned, dark upper parts, white below. Um, in flight, it has a very striking white rump, and the wings are very dark below and above, uh, without any markings. And so at a distance, and in certain lights, they can look black. And so you have a very striking wader, which is looking black and white. The green sandpiper is one of the first uh, autumn migrants to arrive. Uh, it's a bird that breeds in the uh, boreal zone, or the tiger zone of, of the, uh, of, of the nor northern Asia and, uh, and Europe. It nests in trees and it uses the old nests of thrushes in which to breed and the young have to jump out of the nest and drop down onto the ground. And the work of incubation and looking after the young is left with the male. So the female, as soon as she's laid her eggs, can start her return migration, which is why um, you can start getting green sandpipers arriving on passage as early as June. As June. So these are birds that the females that have laid their eggs in May and they're already heading south come, come June. The wood sandpiper is um, uh, s rather similar, it's a bit uh, slimmer, the legs are pale, um, it is more patterned on the, on the wings, much more spotted, uh, it has a supercilium, a pale supercilium, uh, which the green sandpiper doesn't, and the underside of the wing is pale. So there are certain key features that will separate the two, these two rather confusing uh, sandpipers. Then the uh, the other medium-sized sandpiper is the, um, or another one, is a common sandpiper. And this is a very odd-looking wader. Um, it's in a, a genus um, uh, of its own in the old, old world. There, there is a similar species in the same genus in the new world called the spotted sandpiper. The two, those, so those two species are very, uh, very similar to one another, but quite different from other sandpipers. They tend to have rather short legs, pale legs, um, the, and a rather long tail. If you look at the, the green sandpiper here, you can see that the tail barely extends beyond the tips of the wings. If you look at the common sandpiper, the tail extends well beyond the wingtips, and it has a, a very obvious little pale, uh, the, the, the pale underparts sort of extend around the corner, around the elbow of the wing. And that's a very distinctive mark that the common sandpiper has. And the other, uh, there are two other features about a common sandpiper. One is its feeding habitat. So they tend to be uh, close to water, but often feeding um, either on, in, in rocky areas um, or on shingle banks. Uh, so at the water's edge, but not often actually walking in water. So feeding on the dry bank adjacent to water. And when they fly, they have a very distinctive flight. Um, the wing has got this bold, bold white wing bar, which you can see on both the underside and the upper side of the wing. And they fly um, with a, a fluttering flight interrupted by glides. And when the bird is gliding, the wings are held stiffly in this uh, arched fashion. So the wings are sort of arched downwards slightly and held very stiffly. It's a very distinctive flight. There's um, really, there are very few waders that fly in this, in this same way. And then uh, the, the, the final um, medium-sized uh, sandpiper that I'll, I'll cover is the marsh sandpiper, this bird here on the left, and it can sometimes be confused with the much larger green shank. Now the green shank is the bird on the right, and in the photograph it looks smaller than the marsh sandpiper, but of course the marsh sandpiper is closer, uh, is closer to the observer in the picture. So um, the, the green shank is in fact a much bigger bird than the marsh sandpiper, but in terms of plumage, extremely similar. The leg colour is similar, um, this sort of pale uh, greenish colour. The plumage is rather greyish, 
has some stripes, some very fine streaking on the side of the neck. Um, the key difference between the marsh sandpiper and the green shank is again the bill. And this is just emphasizing how important looking at the bill carefully is in identifying many species of waders. The marsh sandpiper has got a straight and a very fine bill indeed. It's almost like a needle, straight um, and very fine. The green shank has got a bill proportionately a similar sort of length, but it's a stouter bill and it has an obvious, very slight curve upwards. So the bill is the key thing to look at separating these two species. And then there are some supplementary features. So for example, marsh sandpipers often have a more distinctive cap. Uh, you can see on this photograph here, the pale supercilium, a well-defined supercilium and a well more defined cap compared with this, um, this green shank, the supercilium really doesn't, uh, it doesn't show very well. It's got a pale in area in front of the eye, but behind the eye, um, the cap merges with the, uh, the cheek at the, the back of the neck of the bird, whereas here it's a more distinct feature with the marsh sandpiper. Now, here we have another two confusing species, and. Uh, we're now into the, into the sh looking at the shanks. We looked at the green shank in the previous slide with its greenish legs. And here we have two species with reddish legs, reddish orange legs. And one is the red shank or common red shank and the other one is the spotted red shank. And uh, you can see the leg color, very similar. Both of them have got uh, straight, bills. Both of them have a reddish at the base of the bill, which becomes dark towards the tip. Um, so what are the differences between these two species? Well, looking at the bill, first of all, the spotted red shank on the right has got a bill which is a little bit longer in proportion. It's finer and it becomes very, very fine towards the tip and is actually very subtly a little sort of uh, at, right at the tip, it's sort of the little bit that, that go, goes down. So it's slightly hooked almost at the, at the tip of the, of the bill. Um, but the plumage is quite different. He, these are birds in, in winter plumage and you can see how the um, common red shank has got this brownish tone and it's got these spots on the underside. The spotted red shank is a much more frosty looking, cold looking bird more gray than brown and much more, much whiter below. Um, so the plumage is, is quite different. And when they fly, the difference is uh, immediate because the red shank um, is a, one of only two waders that have a broad white trailing edge to the wing. And uh, that is obvious when it flies. The uh, spotted red shank has got no markings on the wing. The wing is uniform and dark, um, and it's got a like a little white area in the middle of the back. But the wing of the spotted red shank, all dark, the wing of the common red shank, um, the flight feathers have got this broad white uh, band along the trailing edge of the wing. Spotted red shanks are uh, a very good example of uh, an extraordinary uh, difference between the, the winter plumage and the, and the breeding plumage. So um, the spotted red shank on the left here is uh, non-breeding plumage, right, frosty looking bird. And then you have this stunning bird in the middle, the breeding plumage spotted red shank, uh, black uh, with these white spots on, on, the, on, on the upper parts of the wing and, the, and, uh, and its back. Um, and a beautiful little white, white uh, broken eye ring there. A really stunning bird. And if you're very lucky, you can see spotted red shanks getting into breeding plumage um, just before they head north uh, uh, in, uh, towards the, the middle of spring. And the picture here on the right shows how the wing does not have the broad white at the trailing edge of the wing that the red shank has. The wing is, is fairly uniform and fairly dark. Now this is 
a bird which causes probably the biggest headaches and confusion of all, uh, particularly those who are starting off bird watching, and it's the confusing ruff. Um, it's actually just called ruff, but perhaps it should be called confusing ruff because that's what, what it is. These are all pictures of the same species, and yet you could be looking at four different species here. In this bottom slide on the, on the right, which is the one that I showed at the beginning as, as well, um, two different birds looking very different in terms of their size and their leg colour, in fact. This, the bird behind has got rather reddish, orangey legs, um, and yet they're the same species. So here we have at the top left a ruff in a juvenile ruff, then we have a, a male ruff in winter plumage top right and then a male ruff getting into breeding plumage on the bottom right. The curious thing about ruff, I mean the one thing that all of these pictures have in common is that it's a rather odd looking wader in terms of its shape. It's got a bill which is medium sized, it's just perhaps slightly longer than the head is, is long, and a slight curve to it and rather and a very tapering bill, very uh, deep at the base and tapers. Um, so it's a rather odd, unusual shaped bill. And look at the head. The head is, is quite small compared with the rest of the body. So the bird looks slightly odd in terms of its proportions. Um, let's compare that with the spotted red shank before. Spotted red shank head is looking rather larger compared it, uh, uh, with the, the head of the ruff. Um, this is my more evenly proportioned bird. The ruff has got this rather odd, small, almost sort of pigeon, pigeon-like head uh, attached to, to, to quite a long neck. So it's an odd looking bird. Uh, but it's when you start looking at the plumages and the leg colour that things get really confusing. The juvenile bird has got uh, these very uh, broadly fringed uh, feathers uh, on, on the wing and the back, um, so highly patterned. It's quite buffish, uniform plain buffish on the neck, and the legs are rather dull coloured. The male ruff has got rather orange legs, as, as orange as a, as a common red shank, and a orange base to the bill as well. Um, it's a bit spotted on the front. Uh, if you look at the bottom picture on the right, where you've got a male and female together, the female again is slightly sort of spotted on the, on, on the breast, whereas the juvenile, top left, has got this more even buffish colour on the neck. And then you get the males in breeding plumage, and then you have a huge variety, uh, and that's down to this complex behavior that ruff have. When males on the breeding grounds try to compete for females, they have developed this extraordinary plumage of ruffs, um, very long feathers around the head and the neck and on the back, turning some of the birds into um, very dark looking individuals, uh, some of them are white, uh, some of them are brown, and so you've got a variety of different colours, uh, uh, male ruffs which are looking largely white, ones which are looking largely dark, ones which are looking medium coloured, and they perform a dance and they perform a lek, and, and this is a way of attracting the females. And for anyone who hasn't seen this beautiful behaviour, just find something on YouTube a, 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 a lack of rough and it's, it's tantalizing to watch because they dance, they perform, um, they jump around and all of them in this extraordinary plumage. Uh, you never see a full breeding plumage rough on passage uh, or on the wintering grounds. Uh, in the spring when they're heading north some of them are getting into breeding plumage when they start returning south again they're starting to lose that breeding plumage, but the full breeding plumage is very rare to see outside the breeding sites themselves.
Now, I mentioned red shanks are one of two waders with a, a obvious white trailing edge to the wing, and the other one is the Terek sandpiper. So if you look at the picture at the top left here, a lot of white on the trailing edge of the wing. Uh, so this is a very similar wing pattern to that of the red shank. And the other similarity between a Terek sandpiper and a red shank is the, the bright colored legs. Um, these are quite orange legs. Red, the common red shank has got rather reddish orange legs, but they're bright, bright colored legs. Um, so this is, a, a, the Terek sandpiper is mainly found on the coast. It's a very odd looking bird. Um, the legs are not particularly long. The, uh, the bill, however, is extremely long compared with the uh, size of the head, and it's got this obvious curve upwards here. See, it's, it's an up-curved bill. Um, the bird tends to uh, wag its, its body, uh, which some other sandpipers do as well. It bobs its tail uh, up and down. Uh, that's a very obvious behavior of common sandpipers. You sometimes see green sandpipers do it, and it's very common with the Terek sandpiper, so this sort of bobbing action of the rear part of the, of the body. And it tends to um, run around a lot looking for prey, so it's a very active feeder. Um, and it's a bird which, when it's on the ground, reminds one a little bit of a common sandpiper, but with this monstrous bill, um, but a rather sort of similar sort of plumage colour. Um, and when in flight, it reminds one a bit like a common red shank. So it, it is a, a rather strange uh, and interesting wader to, to see. Um, and the coastal areas, uh, particularly in, in, um, in, in, in west, uh, the west of the subcontinent, are the, the best places to look for the Terek sandpipers in the winter. Now the Terek sandpiper, with this very long, slightly curved upwards bill um, can remind one a little bit of a godwit, the bar-tailed godwit. And so the bill, the bar-tailed godwit is extremely long, um, a good two if not three times the length of the head, shows this gentle curve upwards, and bar-tailed godwits also have um, rather short legs, but they're dark, they're, they've got dark, dark legs, and they're much bigger than Terek sandpipers. Godwits are uh, classified as large um, sandpipers, so they're at the top end of the, of, of the range in terms of their size. And the bar-tailed godwit is the bird which has this extraordinary migration, which I think um, Mike Prince may have spoken about in his talk a few weeks ago. Bar-tailed godwits breed um, across the, the uh, uh, Arctic from Europe and Asia and also breed in Alaska. And they winter in coastal areas and so in the Indian subcontinent they are much more likely to be encountered in the coast. They're going to be very rare inland. Um, but the birds from Alaska are extraordinary because in the autumn they perform the longest non-stop flight of any known bird. So they fly from Alaska all the way down to New Zealand, a journey of nearly 12,000 kilometers, which they do in just over a week, eight or, eight or nine days. Um, the return passage they do in a series of uh, stopovers, Northern Australia um, and China, China Korea, um, before heading back to Alaska. But it's this southward migration in September, which is extraordinary. And in order to achieve this, they um, have, because they're not going to be able to stop, they're not going to be able to eat uh, for eight or nine days. All of that time, they're going to be busy flapping their wings. And they put on huge fat reserves before they set off. They literally double their body weight. And not only that, but they reduce the size of their digestive organs because they're not going to be using the digestive organs at all during that travel. And so they convert some of those digestive organs into, into energy and fat. So the digestive organs get smaller and 
Uh, it's only when they arrive in New Zealand that they rebuild their full digestive system again in order to be able to start feeding. And the other thing about the bar-tailed godwit is that people who study aerodynamics have uh, said that the bird has the ideal shape for a bird that's going to be flying by flapping rather than gliding um, with this long tapering cigar shaped body that is the uh, most efficient body shape to be able to carry out that journey flying over a week across the ocean. The other um, common godwit, uh, which is much more common in inland sites, uh, is the black-tailed godwit. So like the bar-tailed godwit, a very long bill, um, tends to be straighter, doesn't show the slight curve that the, the bar-tailed godwit has. But the most striking separation between the bar-tailed godwit and the black-tailed godwit is look, take a look at the wing. The black-tailed godwit has a broad white stripe along the wing. The bar-tailed godwit has a plain wing. And as the name suggests, uh, the black-tailed godwit has a white rump and a solid black tail, whereas the tail of the bar-tailed godwit uh, is finely barred. Other two waders with very long bills are the Dowitchers, which are much rarer, uh, but they have uh, been recorded um, in, in uh, inland in India and, and, and on the coast. And the two species to consider here are the uh, Asian uh, Dow Witcher and the long billed Dow Witcher. Um, they're both um, medium sized waders, but with extraordinarily long bills, which are absolutely straight. Um, the legs are, are not particularly long, so that the birds appear sort of quite close to the, to the ground. And they have very distinctive, in the winter plumage, very distinctive pale supercilium. And the key way of separating uh, the two species apart is looking at the leg colour. So the Asian Dowitcher has got dark legs, whereas the uh, long-billed Dowitcher has got pale, pale legs. And then we finish looking at the sandpipers with uh, the biggest of all, and that's the, the common curlew uh, and the closely related wimb wimbrel. Um, and the, both of them have got long decurved bills. And the difference between the curlew and the wimbrel is that the wimbrel is a bit smaller. It has a more distinct head pattern with a, a, a line through the eye and a dark crown with a little pale stripe in the middle of the crown. So it's fairly complex head pattern, whereas the curlew is much more uniform on the head. And the bill shape is subtly different as well. Take a look at the curlew's bill, very long and gradually curved all the way down to the tip. The wimbrel has a slightly shorter bill and the bill starts off straight and then curves quite sharply. So it has much more of an obvious sort of angle to the bill than the more gradual curve of the, of the curlew. And this, the picture in the middle shows the two species side by side, big difference in the bill length um, and the difference in the bill shape as well, as well as the difference in the head pattern. Um, within this group, uh, the Scolapic, uh, there are the snipes and a variety of different species of snipe. Let's take a look at um, the common snipe and pintailed snipe, which are the two species you're most likely to encounter. Now, unlike the other waders that I've spoken about so far, these are the exceptions to the rule in that these are usually feeding uh, in cover, in amongst vegetation. And although sometimes you'll see them uh, out in the open, feeding at the edge of vegetation,
they'll, of, they'll usually be either in the vegetation or close to it and sometimes completely hidden from view. And you most often come across snipe when they fly up uh, as you uh, flush them, as you're walking through damp vegetation. Um, and so the, the, the features to look for uh, in separating the common and the pintailed snipe are features that you have to try to pick up as you see the bird flying. So the, at the top here, you see the upper surface of the pintailed snipe on the left, common snipe on the right. And the common snipe has got a more obvious white trailing edge to the wing compared to the pintailed snipe. The flight feathers, particularly the primary feathers, are darker with a common snipe, not quite as dark with the pintailed snipe. And with the pintailed snipe, this pale band uh, across the wing here stands out much more in contrast compared with the uh, rest of the wing. Um, the common snipe has a pale area as well, but the rest of the wing is more patterned, so it doesn't stand out as a striking pale patch uh, as it does with the pintailed snipe. And then if you see the underside of the wing, particularly as the bird is coming to land, as we see in these photographs, the pintailed snipe is very heavily barred. These dark bars across the underside of the wing and very distinct barring on the side of the body here on the flanks. The uh, common snipe has got much whiter, more spotted rather than barred underwing and um, much less neatly barred on the side of the body compared with the pintailed snipe. Um, you don't often see them on the ground very well, but if you do, you would notice that the pintailed snipe is more on here, the bird on the right is more um, uniform colored um, with the side of the wings here uh, appearing quite spotted, a little sort of checker, checker pattern, very, very spotted area here. Um, whereas the common snipe shows much more contrast between very dark looking plumage here and these pale tips to, to the feathers here. So there's much more contrast and it doesn't have that very fine spotting on the side of the wing that the pintailed snipe has. And the, the other fairly widespread snipe um, that uh, you find in the winter in say North India is the jack snipe. Um, these are very hard to see on the ground. So congratulations to the person who took this photograph. Um, but the bill of the jack snipe is much shorter compared with, you go back to the length of the bill here, of the common snipe and pigtailed snipe. A very, very, very long straight bill of the common snipe. The jack snipe has got a bill which is much shorter in comparison. Um, the head pattern's a bit different. It has a, a, an additional pale stripe here that the common snipe doesn't have. But the key difference between the jack snipe and the common snipe and pintail snipe is the behavior. The jack snipe flushes at the very last minute. You're literally treading on it when it takes off. And when it flies up, it drops down into the onto the ground very quickly. It doesn't gain height. It just stays low to the ground and drops down and it's quiet. Um, with the common snipe and pintail snipe, they both call when they are flushed and they tend to fly up often quite high, the common snipe doing a zigzagging flight as it takes off. Um, so this behavior of a jack snipe flying off at the very last minute and dropping down again very quickly is a very distinctive feature of that species. And uh, another very uh, lovely bird to, to look out for, uh, uh, it's again a, quite a, a rare bird to see inland, uh, the redneck phalarope. Um, this is a bird which uh, very distinct juvenile plumage. Uh, the adult is much grayer looking in the winter um, and in the breeding plumage the uh, uh, adult has a bright red neck and it's an unusual uh, bird in that the female is more brightly colored than the male and it's a male that does all of the parental responsibility. 
Um, phalaropes, there are three species of phalarope in the world, and it's the redneck phalarope is the one that um, is, is recorded uh, in, in India. Um, it's a bird which nests high in the Arctic and will generally spend the winter out at sea. Um, so it's a very unusual wader in that it feeds out in the ocean, um, feeding by uh, spinning round and round, uh, bringing up tiny uh, organisms to the water surface and using its very fine needle-like bill to pick food items off the surface of the water, which it has achieved by creating this vortex underneath, underneath it as it spins round and round. They do sometimes feed in a traditional fashion like waders, wading and picking off perhaps small flies from, from the water surface, um, but they, they do prefer to swim and do this very characteristic spinning round and round in one spot. Um, they are often very tame, you can approach them closely. And the redneck phalarope has got this incredibly narrow, uh, very fine needle-like bill, a small, delicate, gorgeous looking wader. Now what's fascinating about the redneck phalarope is looking at its distribution it breeds all the way across the Arctic, both the New World and Old World. And as you can see, winters in, uh, in, in, in the tropical zone, um, mainly as a pelagic species, so out in the op open sea, but you know, will be sometimes close to the coast, particularly on passage, it may, may turn up. And you do get records inland, as there have been near, near, near Delhi. Um, but if you look at this map, uh, and look at its distribution. I'm going to pinpoint the populations here in the north of the British Isles. There are, there's a small population of redneck phalarope that nest in the islands of Scotland. And it was long thought that this, this population joined the ones that breed in Scandinavia and winter down in the Arabian, either off the Arabian Sea here, off the uh, Arabian Peninsula, or off the west coast of Africa. But recently, thanks to uh, tagging some individuals, a quite different and completely surprising migration route and wintering area was discovered for this population from northern Scotland. Only discovered in 2013, what it was found was that birds from northern Scotland in fact, cross the Atlantic. They take six days crossing the Atlantic. They can stop, unlike the bar-tailed godwits, these are birds that are adapted to life in the ocean. So they can stop and rest and swim and feed uh, during that journey. But they're, they're taking six days to cross to, to Canada. And then they spend um, uh, a few weeks uh, off the east coast of North America and then travel across the Gulf of Mexico, travel, fly over Central America, and then spend the winter in the Pacific on the uh, western coast of South America, off the coast of Panama and uh, Colombia, Ecuador and Peru, and then fly back across Central America over the uh, Caribbean, and leave the east coast round about the uh, in late May, flying, uh, a, taking a week or so to return back to uh, the, the, the British Isles. No one, no one had any idea that these birds had that, made that journey. And what that suggests is that the um, redneck phalaropes that breed in the north of the British Isles are in fact belonging to, to the population from north America, Greenland and Iceland, which do the same. So uh, they're not of the Scandinavian origin at all, but actually from the New World that are colonized from the West uh, to, to, to breed in Britain. So just a, one of these fascinating examples of what we're learning thanks to the tagging, satellite tagging and, and geolocator tagging of birds nowadays. Right. Now let's look at another group, the other big group of waders, which are the plovers. And these are a very diverse group um, and include both what we call plovers, but also lapwings. 
but they also include this group also includes birds like ibis bill the avocets the stilts and oyster catchers and all tend to have very striking plumage and if you look uh, here we have ibis bill oyster catchers avocet and stilts um, very very striking very distinctive looking looking waders indeed uh, and these particular species are of course pretty unmistakable but we'll focus first of all on plovers and these are birds with short straight bills the legs are a sort of medium length and they all typically have this 3p feeding method taking a few steps stopping looking around and pecking and the reason they're doing that is that they're finding prey by sight they're visual feeders they don't use a touch to detect prey they're looking for evidence on the surface of the eye uh, of the mud and they're feeding mainly on dry surfaces on the surface of the mud or the sand for any evidence of that there's a small uh, a prey item there for them to feed and the plovers you can divide into the small and the large plovers so let's look at the small ones first of all and these I would call the ringed type plovers so starting at the top left we have the long billed plover and then we have the common ringed plover and then bottom uh, left is the little ringed plover and then we have the Kentish plover uh, bottom right. Uh, all very boldly marked and the, the critical thing about these uh, small plovers is to uh, look at the colour of the legs. In the breeding season, these are all in breeding plumages, there are uh, differences as well which make them quite easy to identify. Um, Perhaps the, hard, the perhaps the easiest of this four is the Kentish plover with this beautiful chestnut crown and a black mark at the side, uh, which doesn't extend all the way around the underparts. Whereas the, um, the little ringed and the common ring plover has got a, a complete band across the, the chest. Um, the little ringed plover has got uh, uh, an obvious pale eye ring. Um, the long-billed plover is a rather duller looking bird, very dark tail compared with the little ring plover. Uh, common ring plover has an obvious wing stripe like the Kentish plover has as well. But the key uniform uh, feature that will work both in breeding plumage and in non-breeding plumage is the colour of the legs. And so you have bright orange legs with the common ring plover, black legs with the Kentish plover and then sort of medium uh, uh, rather dull but pale dull coloured legs with the long-billed plover and the little ringed plover. And I'll take the, the three uh, species of the um, uh, that you're mainly going to be encountering perhaps in uh, over much of India here we have the in non-breeding plumage, they are all very similar to one another uh, with a patch at the side of the chest there. And they're all rather similar sort of shape. You can see the bills uh, straight and short, but look, check out the leg color. Kentish plover, black. Common ring plover, bright, bright colored orange legs and the little ring plover rather duller legs. Uh, a little ring plover when you see them next to a common ring plover also clearly much short, uh, much smaller than the than the uh, common ring plover and then things get particularly confusing when you go down to coastal areas in particular when you have to take into account the sand plovers now the sand plovers are rather longer legged and bigger build than the uh, uh, that group of ringed plovers um, but uh, you have the, the um, lesser sand plover and the greater sand plover and the key difference here is looking at the bill. The bill of the uh, lesser sand plover uh, tends to be fit a bit shorter so if you look at the distance from the bill base to the bill tip and then the distance from the tip of the bill to the eye 
the bill length of the lesser sand plover is about that distance, whereas the bill length of the greater sand plover is, is longer than the distance between the base of the bill and the eye. Um, I'll show you in the next picture, you'll see the bill shape also quite, quite clearly. These are in non-breeding plumage. The plumage is rather similar. Um, the legs of the greater sand plover appear a bit longer than the um, uh, lesser sand plover, but really it's the bill, you need to really focus again, and this is like the take home message for, for waders in general, really look at the bill, work out what that bill looks like. And here we have um, greater sand plover on the left, lesser sand plover on the right, and this actually shows it much more clearly because the angle that the bird is in is identical. Look how much longer the greater sand plover bill is compared with the lesser sand plover. Um, that lesser sand plover bill is uh, shorter than the distance behind from the eye to the base of the bill. The, ba the bill length of the greater sand plover is longer from the base of the bill than to the eye. The um, lesser sand plover has a bill which is more blunt at the tip, whereas the greater sand plover has got more of a pointed bill and the length uh, the, the color of the legs also is that the greater sand plover will tend to have paler and longer looking legs than the uh, lesser sand plover particularly the um, the distance from the um, the belly to the first joint of the leg here tends to be longer with the greater sand plover than with the lesser sand plover in summer plumage breeding plumage um, they're also quite easy to separate. You've got much broader, more diffuse orange pattern here, and uh, or the greater sand plover, it's much more clearly defined and neat with the lesser sand plover. And then you have the two large plovers, uh, the grey plover and the Pacific golden plover. Um, the grey plover is predominantly a coastal species. Uh, the Pacific Golden Plover is much more commonly found inland, but you do get grey plover also turning up at inland sites as well. And uh, in winter plumage, these pictures are in winter plumage, you can see how the grey plover really does look grey, uh, uh, whereas the Pacific Golden Plover has got much more, uh, more richly coloured markings on, on, the, on the back with obvious sort of more golden uh, edgings to the to the feathers. In the breeding plumage superficially more similar again but um, the the grey plover on the right uh, essentially black and white and the uh, gold uh, Pacific golden has got much more of these um, golden spots uh, much more uh, varied pattern colors on the on the back. The key thing also is in flight, uh, the grey plover shows this obvious solid black axillary, which is like the armpit. So where the wing base, wing base meets the side of the body, you have this black patch, uh, which stands out very clearly when the bird flies. With the Pacific golden plover, it's pale, it's grey, uh, and, e and, and even grey across the whole of the underwing. So you don't have a, a contrasting patch at the base of the wing as you do with the, the grey plover. The other big group of plovers are the lapwings, um, of which there's a, India boasts a, a large range of species. Now these feed mainly on dry ground. You don't often see them feeding in water. You do sometimes, but generally they feed on, on dry ground. Um, some of them in, in actually preferring quite arid terrain. Like all plovers, they have this very distinctive 3P feeding method, pace, pause and peck. So they're visual feeders. They're feeding on items of prey that they can see. They are usually very boldly marked, especially on their wings, which are, tend to be quite rounded, and their flight is rather slow and heavy. Some lapwings have wing spurs or brightly coloured facial 
uh, wattles, bare skin on their face, and they're often very noisy birds as well. And you know, the species that everyone will be familiar with, the red wattled lapwing, a very noisy characteristic species. And you can see this very striking plumage, very rounded wings, very bold markings, uh, you know, a typical lapwing. The yellow wattled lapwing, again, uh, you know, with this uh, appearance, uh, quite straightforward to identify. Um, sociable lapwings are a, a, a rare winter visitor, so, so mainly uh, one can find them in places like Gujarat. Um, this is a globally endangered species and uh, the plumage is um, less brightly coloured. In the breeding plumage they have a rather dark belly, uh, but you don't tend to see that very often on the wintering grounds. You might be lucky enough to see them getting into breeding plumage at the end of the uh, just before they, they start their return migration. Um, but a very striking wing pattern, uh, black uh, ha uh, outer half of the wing and this two-toned two um, half of the wing close to the body with the white on the secondaries and the brown wing cover. It's a very, very attractive bird indeed. There are lapwings with crests, so the river lapwing, um, and the northern lapwing, uh, both have crests. Again, very distinctive looking birds. Uh, lapwings generally are fairly, easy, you know, pretty easy to identify because of their bold patterning. And you can see with the northern lapwing here, again, this very distinctive, very round looking uh, uh, feather, uh, wing, wing feathers, very boldly patterned bird. There are plainer looking lapwings, the grey headed and the, and the white tailed. Um, but here again, look at the bill colour. Both have got long yellow legs, but the white tailed has got a dark bill. The grey headed has got a, a, a yellow bill with a black tip and the eyes tend to be a bit more reddish compared with the darker eyes of the blacker eyes of the white tailed. So, and, and, very, and finally, um, just to see pictures of some of the other types of waders, um, crab plover, uh, the courses here. Um, these are all considered as waders. I'm not going to go into any detailed discussion of these. Crab plovers are interesting because they're the only wader which nests in burrows. Uh, courses are pretty nocturnal in their behavior, as are the thick knees. Um, here, uh, so here we have two thick knees. Um, uh, and there's also a, a pratting coal here. Um, the pratting coals have, are uh, a very distinctive feeding behavior. They're the only wader. There are two species that you'll find uh, oriental pratting coal and small pratting coal in, in, in India. And they feed uh, on, in flight. They're the only waders that will be catching flying insects in flight. And so it's completely different type of behavior, a very strange wader. It's a bird that I always think is very difficult to fit into any particular group because they, they, because they, they fly uh, catching insects on the wing and the bill's very short, very short legged. You wouldn't think of it as a wader, but it is classified as a, as a wader. And then these are all classified as waders again, but it's fairly straightforward to identify again. So we don't need to go into any really discussion about these. These will be familiar species to you. What's interesting about the, the painted snipe and the, the, the two jacanas, um, the pheasant tail and the bronze winged jacana is that with all these three species, like some other waders, it's the male that performs the parental duties. Uh, so there's this Re role reversal that you see with um, a, a few wader species and that's evolved in places where um, the food is uh, generally the food is very abundant and the female is going to have more success by um, laying uh, a clutch and then moving on with another male and laying another clutch and so um, the, uh, leaving the responsibility of looking after the eggs and the young with the male. So thank you very much indeed. Um, that will be, that's the, uh, the end of the talk there with a greater sand plover, look at that 
huge, heavy, stout bill, the greater sand plover. And I just want to finish by setting the question of the day, uh, which I understand is a feature of the webinars now, um, thanks to the um, sponsorship from Zeiss. And so you have an opportunity of winning a very exciting prize from Zeiss. And the question that I'm setting for you is, where does the name Pratting Coal come from? And there's the, uh, the website there where you can submit your, your answer. So there's a link there to send your answer through. Okay, thank you. I will... Uh, Thank you, Martin. Yeah, that back. was a really interesting talk, very <laughs> comprehensive. So hopefully next time in the field, all of us would be able to ID waders more easily. Uh, just a uh, uh, not notice to everyone on the talk, the chat box has now been opened. So in case you have any questions for Martin, you can type them there. And while we have the questions coming in, uh, there are a few announcements that uh, I'd make in the meantime. Just give me a second. Okay, so the first announcement is that one of our partners for this for these webinars and talks is Sanctuary Nature Foundation. So as a part of this, uh, as as a part of being uh, attending these talks, Sanctuary Nature Foundation gives a free one year digital subscription to the Sanctuary Asia magazine or the Sanctuary Asia Cub magazine for kids. So all of you are entitled to receiving this free one year digital subscription. In order to avail yours, you can just go to the Delhi Bird Foundation website, which is www.delibirdfoundation.org slash offers and get your free digital subscription from there. The second announcement is that uh, Early Bird in association with Delhi Bird is organizing a bird quiz for young birders. This is going to be held on Sunday, the 5th of July at 11 a.m. So if you know any children who would be interested in participating, please, uh, you can register using this link. Uh, you can take a screenshot or photograph of this slide. I'll leave it on for the next five to 10 seconds so that you can note down the registration link for this. Okay, moving on, we have another announcement about the Great Indian Nature Quiz, which is going to be held on Sunday, the 12th of July at 5 p.m. This is going to be hosted by Bikram Krewal, and it's, there's no prior registration required. Everybody can uh, participate using their mobile phones. We'll be giving more details closer to the date, but please just block your dates for this quiz. And next week, we have two other, other interesting talks coming up. So the uh, one on next Saturday, which is 4th of July, we have Ashish Pitti talking about ornithological bibliography. So he's going to give us a tour of his fabulous library. So this should be a very interesting talk. And on Sunday, the 5th of July, we have Bittu Sagar talking tigers. So hopefully we'll see you all next weekend for these talks as well. And now we can move on to questions for Martin. Okay. Um... I, so I can see the questions that are appearing on the on the chat. Um, okay. so if you'd like, I could read them out to you as well. Like whatever. perfect. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So everyone can can hear them. Very yes. good. Thank you. Perfect. So there's this one question from Nosherwan who's asking any clue as to why the female green sandpiper migrates earlier than the males. So I think this is something you touched upon during the yeah. talk as well. Okay, so um, yeah, thank you very much for that question, uh, Nashawan. That's an uh, ex excellent question. Um, I mean, green sandpipers are certainly, I, I, I recall from, from India, correct me if I'm wrong, but certainly here in Spain as well, it's the, the first wader that you see coming back and uh, they start appearing in, 
in June. Uh, in some of my local bird birding areas here, I've been seeing green sandpipers now for about, about three weeks. Um, and uh, it appears that these are all, they're all adults and um, they will be largely females. And the reason why um, they are mainly female green sandpipers is because like some other species, um, once the female has laid her eggs, she then finishes, that's it. So there is no, uh, she leaves the responsibility to the male to, um, to incubate and to raise the, the young and the female is free to, to go and she, she starts her migration and that's why it's the female that arrives before the male. The males that are arriving at this time of the year would be birds that for some reason or another have failed to breed. Um, but the females are likely to have, um, that the male is still on the breeding grounds with the young birds and uh, she's, she's already on her way south. Um, now I hasten to add that you cannot tell a male and a female green sandpiper in the field. You can't separate them, they look the same. And so we, we know that it's the females arriving first because of birds that have been, um, have been marked, birds that have been ringed, birds that have been tracked. So this, you know, it's a piece of information that comes out of the research. Um, and so a lot, in June, July, August, pretty much all of the waders that you will see will be adult birds. It's only from late August and September that you start to get the juveniles appearing. And uh, juveniles tend to be easier to identify because of the characteristics I talked about of, you know, in all waders uh, earlier on, how their, their plumage tends to be much more patterned on the back because of the pale fringes on the feathers and the very fresh plumage that they have. Okay. Yep, I think we actually got our first green sandpiper in Delhi about a couple of weeks back. So could there you are. Quite possibly a female, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So the chances are she's a female bird and her mate and her offspring are still on the breeding grounds. Right. A question from Shaila now. Do the bar-tailed godwits not sleep for eight days while migrating? Simple answer to that is no, they don't. No, they, ha they have to fly the whole time. They can't stop and rest. There's nowhere for them to do that because they're just flying over the sea. Um, and uh, I mean, we know that for certain. It's not as if they pitch down and, and swim. I mean, theoretically, they could swim, but we know that uh, from the um, geolocator and the satellite tracking that they are moving the whole time to do that journey. So that, no, they, they, they don't sleep. It's remarkable, isn't it? The metabolism of these birds to be able to accomplish that feat. Um, and, you know, the question is why why, why do they do that? Well, you know, I, I think people reckon that it's, it's just a strategy to get them down to New Zealand as quickly as possible, which is where they want to be for the winter. Right. Quite fascinating. Uh, another question that we have is, what has been the impact of climate change on waders? Well, um, the... You know, a lot of the waders are, are migratory um, and many of those are nesting in the high Arctic. And I think we're all aware at the moment that there is a, a massive heat wave at the moment in Siberia, in extraordinary temperatures, 30 degrees Celsius in, in places where at this time of the year it should be, you know, 10 degrees or something. And um, as a result of the changing weather patterns in, in the high Arctic, it's having dramatic effects on the ecology. Um, and, you know, many of these waders are nesting in fairly boggy areas on tundra. Uh, and if you're going to get situations where you've got higher temperatures, the habitat becomes drier, um, there may be fewer insects uh, because it's less, less wet. Uh, the, the places where they nest may be more accessible to predators um, and eventually also the vegetation may start to change. So um, the predictions, particularly for the high Arctic species, 
like the stints and um, uh, fallow ropes and so on is not, not looking good. Um, and that's not then taking into account any changes that are happening on the winter grounds as well. Um, now, obviously, a lot of the waders are feeding in coastal areas, so perhaps the impact is, is, is less. But, you know, there are waders which are uh, feeding uh, or having stopover areas in inland wetlands. You know, the birds that are flying across the continents are, unlike, unlike the Bartow Godwit crossing the Pacific Ocean, um, the uh, waders which are crossing big land masses will have regular stopover areas and if some of those are wetlands which are then starting to dry out because of changing rainfall patterns that will influence the success of the migration as well. Mm -hmm. I think a related question here that we've just got is what are the factors that are contributing to making the spoonbill sandpiper a critically endangered species? Yeah, well, that's again, a, uh, that's a fairly complex problem. Um, I think it's partly that there's a lot on the internet to read about spoonbilled sandpipers because it's a massive conservation program going ahead involving many different countries uh, right across the migration flyway that the spoonbilled sandpiper has. So involving governments and conservationists in in Russia, um, China, um, Southeast Asia, uh, um, ornithologists in, 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 in Bangladesh, in uh, India, Sri Lanka, there's an international working group looking at uh, the conservation of, of the bird and so on. So it's a massive, it's one of the biggest international conservation programs taking place. And there's also work being done in the captive breeding of uh, spoon-billed sandpipers to try and increase their reproductive success. Because um, I think that the you know some of the, some of the factors were factors affecting the birds on the breeding grounds. So um, that for some reason they were having poor breeding success. And with the, what the captive breeding is doing is. Um, uh, removing eggs from nests, uh, just one or two eggs out of a clutch, getting those eggs then hatched in, in, in captivity whilst the pair in the wild are, you know, laying, uh, she, the female lays additional eggs to replace the ones that she's lost. And so they complete their clutch, they, 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 they raise, they incubate and raise their young in the wild. Meanwhile, in parallel, there's a, a program underway with the incubation of eggs that have been taken, um, rearing of young, and then releasing the young uh, back onto the uh, uh, onto the breeding areas, uh, to so that they are then able to migrate with the rest with the wild population um, southwards. So it's a way of enhancing the productivity of the population, and it's going it's 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 being done very carefully and very successfully. So part of the problem was a low breeding success. Um, and I think that that was probably related to things like predation and potentially also some environmental change. But a big problem, current threat to the spoonbill sandpiper is also the development happening on, in coastal areas that are critical as stopover feeding areas for spoonbill sandpipers, particularly in um, in the coastline around Korea and, and, and China, industrial development. Um, the spoonbill sandpiper seems to be particularly uh, reliant on specific sites where they stop and rest on migration. And if a particular site gets developed or, or deteriorates uh, in terms of the quality for the spoonbill sandpiper, then that will um, increase the mortality of the bird during migration um, and so a lot of the conservation effort is is being done to ensure that the stopover areas are properly protected that development programs are being either put in other locations or being done in such a way to try and reduce levels of pollution and disturbance for the for the spoon build sandpipers and and, and other, other waders, because there are a number of waders from eastern Siberia that follow that, that uh, pathway migration route, um, or, and, and other species like northern green shank and so on are also uh, uh, under threat. 
Right. Uh, I think we'll close with that. Thank you so much, Martin. This has been a fantastic webinar. And we look forward to maybe having you do a few more in the future. Well, uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, thank you very much for inviting me again. Uh, congratulations to, to the organizers for developing this series in such a successful way. I don't think, well, I had no idea, and I suspect you had no idea when you started that uh, it was going to be as uh, successful and well attended and supported in the way it has come. Uh, has developed and the themes that are being covered are varied and but all of them very very fascinating so congratulations to you all and good birding thank you martin thank you everyone for joining see you all next week bye 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 <clears throat>